Well, I'd like to welcome any visitors. It's uh, good to have some of the families, uh, their kids are coming home for Thanksgiving. So we, we're grateful to have you and grateful uh, for any just regular visitors who have showed up this morning. We're, we worship uh, the living God here and we believe that preaching is worship as well. So we're going to continue in our worship service now in First Peter. Uh, we're going to look at First Peter. Where we've been studying chapter 2. We're in this section right now on verses 4 through 12. We're, we're looking at the New Testament temple. And I, I just love this temple. It's, it's just beautiful what God has designed. So last week we began looking at the foundation of this temple. We looked at the cornerstone in verse 4. Today we're going to delve in a little deeper into this picture of the church And it really just gets better and better the deeper you dig into this metaphor. And so I'm praying that we would see it and that the glory of God would shine forth from this temple here at Southside Bible Church for all of the world to see. First, before we begin, I just wanted to kind of give you a lay of the land for the next few months. We're going to stay in this section until we finish it uh, in verse 12. So I'm thinking about four more weeks Then we're going to pull out for a couple weeks to just look at the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that the Word of God became flesh. Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday this year, and we'll have our normal service in the morning at 1030, and then that night, we are going to have a Christmas Eve service. It's going to be really toned down, though. It's actually going to be in the fellowship hall with the fireplace going, and we'll have the candles and everything, so that will be uh, on Christmas Eve night. So the gospel will be preached at both services, and so I want you to get out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. It's on a Sunday, so people usually aren't working on a Sunday to come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. If if you've spent a year and you have no one to invite, I want to exhort you, don't ever let that happen again. Get out, love unbelievers, get in their lives, know them, bring Jesus Christ to them. And anyone who brings a guest, I'm going to give you a chocolate Santa at the end of the service. (laughs) That blesses me that you laughed because you know I'm joking. So, (laughs) So we're going to be doing the Advent again as well. And we'll have a family that will start the service, and they'll be doing readings from uh, some writings that John Piper did to help us uh, worship God this incarnation season. Sunday school, uh, as Joel mentioned, we'll be spending some time uh, how not to miss Christ this Christmas. So let's dig in in this season ahead and really grow in our love for Christ, that that, uh, that he, he came into the world to die for sinners, and I, I don't want us to, to lose that focus. And then a reminder, this Thursday is the Turkey Bowl at uh, Lutheran High School. We'll be playing that. It's our 19th annual. So I was there for the first one, and uh, I'm going to be playing in the grandparent game. So we've got th- four games going on, and so grandparents, come. It's really a lot of fun, and we can have three generations playing football together. So encourage all of you to come. There'll be every level of competition uh, at that game. So let's turn our attention then to this most beautiful passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I would like to go before God and ask His blessing as we open up this Word. Father, we come before You and we come this morning just to worship. We worship You for who You are, for what You have done, and what You will do in the consummation of all things. God, we thank you for this blessed hope that we all sit here with faith in Christ this morning. I I pray that it would be today, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come back for your bride and and, and consummate all things. God, we thank you that you are already doing this work of redemption in your bride. And I thank you now that we are the ones that put on display the glory of God. I pray this morning now, Lord, as we open this word that your spirit would teach us that we would not just understand the temple, but that we would be those who are offering up spiritual sacrifices. God, do not let us uh, just sit and be lukewarm and be hearers of the word and not doers. God, by your spirit, bring deep repentance to every heart here this morning that we, by the spirit of God, would, would enact our gift that is necessary for this glory to go forth from the bride of Christ. God, let us be uh, diligent, 
diligent in laboring for the name that is above all names. For you have given us the grand motivation of, of your mercies. God, I pray that everyone in this room would offer up their bodies a living sacrifice. Awaken apathy, God. Stir us by the truth of your word to live holy lives. God, we pray that you meet us in a special way then here this morning in this word. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Your outline that we've been looking at four elements to understand the temple of God today. Last week we began looking at the construction of the temple in verses 4 and 5. And we're going to finish that this morning. And then next week we'll look at verses 6 through 8. Really, what is the foundation of this temple from the Old Testament? And then in 9 through 10, we'll look at the significance of this temple is to put on the display the the glory of God. And then in verses 11 through 12, what kind of priest are we to be? There's to be a holiness about us in this new temple of God. So this morning, we're going to continue then in verses 4 through 5. Let me read them to you, the construction of the temple. Peter says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is now building a new temple. And this temple is not made out of marble and stone. And God doesn't throw this big uh, slab of marble stone down as the cornerstone for this temple. He places the foundation stone to be his very son, the son of God. The son who was co-eternal and co-equal with God is the cornerstone of this temple. In the most beautiful and amazing relationship with the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, the best and deepest communion you can imagine, he sends that son forth to place him as our cornerstone. And so my question is, how does he place this stone to bear up such a massive temple. And so he does it by the son had to leave glory. He had to leave that fellowship, that communion, that intimacy. And he comes and he takes on human flesh that we'll be looking at for the next month. And he comes in that flesh now and he fulfills all the righteousness that God required to be in his presence. He comes and he, he lives the life that you should have. He, he loved God with all of his being and his neighbor as himself. He fulfills it, and then he comes and he pays the penalty for all the offenses to that righteousness, all the offenses against God's righteousness. He comes, he goes up on a cross, and he bears the punishment, the full wrath of God for sin. He dies on that cross. He breathes his last. He was looked at and rejected by men. Peter says they they assessed him. They looked at him when he came to this earth, and they say, I see no value in this cornerstone, and they put him up on a tree. They delivered him over to the painful and humiliating death of crucifixion. He is now taken down from the cross dead. He's placed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. A large stone is rolled in front of the grave to protect it. And on the third day, that stone is removed and his body has been raised. Uh, He's been raised bodily from the dead. And then he appears to many witnesses And he shows convincing proofs that he's alive and he has conquered death. He opens the mind of his disciples and, and they get it now. They understand the two advent plan of God, that he would come as a lamb to be sacrificed and then he would come in glory to conquer and and destroy. That's the two advent, and and that the the Gentiles now, the inclusion, that they're being brought in, all the nations now, into the kingdom of God. And so he opens their minds to understand that, and then he ascends into heaven, and they watch him go up, where he is now seated at the right hand of God in complete victory over sin and death this very morning. Last week we saw that God now takes that precious Christ, the one who has done his will, this precious gem And he places that as the cornerstone for the whole temple that he is now going to build with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he's got this massive cornerstone named Jesus Christ in complete victory over sin. On this rock, I will build my church. He will be the foundation stone and the head of the church. Upon this rock, I will build this church. Peter said, who, who who do men say I am? Peter said, you're the Christ 
You're the son of the living God, yes, and upon this rock I will build my church. Upon this truth, me being the Messiah, me being the Christ, I will be the fountain stone and I will build the church of God on me. Ephesians 2.19, Paul said this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, the cornerstone, and whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit, by the Spirit of God. And so this is beautiful. Jesus is our cornerstone, and we are living stones, every believer being fitted together, and we are growing into this holy temple now. The the temple of God, no longer brick and mortar, but now a spiritual temple being built together into the dwelling of God as we are uh, housed by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is now in heaven. He's the foundation stone. By his spirit, he's filling every believer who comes to him and every believer who keeps coming to him last week, coming to him as to a living stone. And now the Spirit of God, he doesn't dwell in the Holy of Holies any longer. He tabernacles among men, an incarnation, so to speak. He takes on our flesh and he indwells us. And so it's not a temple any any longer. It's not the, the holy place where God dwells. But all of us come to him We're filled with his spirit. We are the housing place now for the glory of God. We are the housing place for the spirit of God. And there's something now so far superior to put God's glory on display than that temple. It's now our temple. He takes up residence in every stone and he places them in the temple. And so this here, This morning is the temple of God, where the glory of God dwells by his spirit. I I like this so much better than brick and mortar. You're living stones, believers. Flesh and blood and dwelt by the spirit of God. Stones from all over the world. We got every parts of the world represented here. There's stones from all ages, stones from, again, every tribe, tongue, and nation being fitted together into the dwelling place of God. Isn't this amazing? Look with me at verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as to a spiritual house. And this is interesting. When I think of stones, when you think of stones, do you usually think of life? (laughs) Stones, life. I think of stone dead. I think of stone hands. I think of stony hearts. It's not uh, an analogy that your mind usually jumps to. Oh, life, stone life. But I usually run to death. And so we, who are dead in our trespasses and sins in Ephesians 2, 1, are stone dead spiritually. You're dead, a dead stone. And he's saying, you come to Christ You come to the living stone, the cornerstone, and in him you are made alive. His life infused into yours, and you are alive forevermore. You have eternal life now dwelling in you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Who believes in me shall live even if he dies. We come to him, and we receive life from him by his spirit. Dead stones are made alive to God, made alive in Christ. This beautiful cornerstone, you are now alive to him. He's not something that you see no value in. He's a treasure hidden in a field. You'll sell everything that you can have it. I am now alive to the cornerstone. I love him, here's my life. Everything will be based on this cornerstone. I'm alive to Christ. He's given me life. I was a dead stone and he's given life to me. In him we receive life. Coming to him again and again we receive life. So much so that now we are called living 
stones. I am made alive. Uh, Paul said in Ephesians 2, God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead stones in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, the cornerstone. By grace, you have been saved. Romans 6 says, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Life. Life. If you could describe salvation in a word, it's life. Life from the dead. They said of George Whitfield, he just seems so alive. Is that what they say of you? Life. They, they are just so alive in Christ. He's made me alive. Dead stones are now living stones. I was so dead to Christ, and now I'm alive to Christ. I used to persecute anyone who named the name of Jesus Christ, and now I persecute anyone who doesn't name the name of Jesus Christ. I follow them around and hound them for this life. You are alive to Christ. He is precious to me. He's choice to me. I see the utmost value in Christ. I have a whole new reckoning. All the things that I used to count as gain, I count as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else has become manure compared to this living stone that I've been made alive to. I'm so alive. God takes you. I love this. You're a living stone infused with the life of Christ from being joined to him by his spirit, abiding in life with Christ by coming to him. And now he places you strategically in the temple of God, living stones in God's new temple. You're placed in it. And when you're building a temple or a house, you need the right size stones for the different places of the building. And so God says you're being fitted together. You're, you're, you're exactly the, the stone that we need in, in the temple. And he, he finds the right stones, where you come from, your makeups, all these different gifts. He puts you in this temple, and everything finds its symmetry in the cornerstone. So we're all these living stones, and what makes this is all of us are finding life in the cornerstone. He's the center of all. It's what unifies us and brings this glorious life. So he now places you in the temple of God. Listen to what Paul said. I want to read his thoughts on 1 Corinthians 3, if you'll listen to this. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another now is building upon it. <clears throat> but let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. You better not lay another foundation than this cornerstone, Christ. Now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire on the day of judgment. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. There's a reverence to this temple for me to be holy. God takes these living stones. He's building up a spiritual house called a temple. The church of God is the temple, which is right now in the process of being built, and it's not done yet. When the last stone is laid in this temple, Jesus Christ is going to return. And since it's a spiritual temple, I, I can't tell you when this temple is going to be finished I can't even tell you what percentage is finished right now. Only God knows that. But I can tell you this. The building is closer to being finished than when you, when you first believed. We are closer to the last stone coming in. And I pray it's one of you that share the gospel with that last stone. So talking with people nowadays, what's amazing is we all see that this world is falling apart. 
and, and people in America especially, we're stumped. We've lost hope of any kind of a future. They don't believe better days are ahead. Yet as you look at history, doesn't it kind of seem confusing? But in every generation, here's history, God is taking out certain stones from all over the world. And he's joining them to Jesus Christ, and they're becoming living stones. And he's adding them to the building of God. That is history. Romans 11 says that's history. That is what God is doing in this world, saving Jew and Gentile. And it's going forth according to God's purpose by chosen stones that are being rejected by this world, but chosen by God, and they're being placed in this temple. And for what? If you'll look with me in verse 5. What reason well, for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices? Peter now mixes his metaphors. This always messed with me when I studied this passage. But what I've come to is no metaphor can hold all of this truth. It's just too glorious. It's too infinite. It, you, one metaphor doesn't work for this truth. And so we're going to go from being living stones in the temple to now priests in the temple who are offering up sacrifices. Living stones now offering up sacrifices. So I think Peter's mixing the metaphor now to get the whole picture as he's thinking about this whole new temple. And so the temple is being constructed. There's no more physical but spiritual, but there's also no more priests. There's no more priests in the kingdom of God now. There's no more burnt offerings and sacrifices being brought again and again. There's, there's new kind of offerings, and Peter says they're going to be spiritual offerings. We don't bring goats and bulls anymore. We now are going to be priests, and we're the ones bringing spiritual offerings. And so here's a new metaphor, but with the same picture. And so as I was considering the fullness of this metaphor, something was brought to mind, and I was thinking about when God brought Israel out of slavery. When they were in slavery, and he brings them out of Egypt, He delivers them and he makes them a nation. He sets them apart for him so that they will put his glory on display to the world. I want you just to listen to Exodus 19. Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say, (coughs) excuse me, to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Now we're hearing almost the exact same language from Peter. He's talking about now those in the church And we've been delivered from the bondage of sin and death. And now we are in a new covenant community called the church where we're to be priests. And we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. And then that same glory from the temple will shine forth that did in the burning bush from the church manifesting God to the world. This is the fulfillment of it. We're the ones now who are going to show forth the glory of God as we're joined to this living stone and start being changed into his image. And we're going to look at that for a whole Sunday in verses 9 through 10. But what I want you to see this morning is God's glory dwells right in our midst. The glory of God is here this morning. It is in my heart, yes, the Spirit dwells inside each believer. But that isn't what this passage is talking about. This passage is corporate. You're being built up as a holy temple. And as we come together, when the church is assembled, built together, we become a community that serves God and serves others. The glory is put on display when the church is gathered. God inhabits his people in an assembly as a lampstand being in our very presence. The glory of God is with him dwelling in each one of us and us coming together now corporately as living stones. We are to show forth the glory of our God and amazing things should happen when the church is gathered. There is this beautiful access to his glory in community. This is what he's talking about. 
So I experience it in such a beautiful way every Sunday when I come here to worship and be with the saints and to show forth God's glory and all of these things. It is glorious to have God's people together. I was so glad when they said it to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I love the Lord's Day. Friday night, I had all the college kids and career over to my house, and I was just looking. There were just little stones from all walks of life. You know, I, I, I was enjoying a, a sweet young man who, who shared that he, he, he'd been in some really bad things, and drugs, different things, and he was sitting with these two sweet young men who had been taught well, homeschooled, just, and they were just fellowshipping, enjoying each other, and, and, and I just kept watching, and it was just beautiful to see all these different living stones, the glory of God being manifested as we come together in all of our differences. You can't find unity with this much difference anywhere. And it just, guys, it, it puts on display the glory of God when you have this whole church where, where all of you come from and how different you are. And we are so one because of our cornerstone. It puts a glory that this world can't find. They, they are trying so hard to find unity and it's just getting worse. And we get to put on display the kingdom of God and his glory right here as the temple of God uh, because we're attached to the cornerstone. Beautiful. The church is the place where his glory dwells. If his glory is in the church, then it's going to always be breaking out. And I think we fence it in with small expectations and ambitions. I think we don't get the power of God and what this can really be. I really don't think we get it. We, we, we don't think high enough of what can and what should happen if all these stones show forth the glory of God. God's glory went away. They, they killed it when it was manifested in Jesus Christ. So where is his glory now? His glory is in our very midst this morning. The church assembled coming to him as living stones, giving spiritual sacrifices. Therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so now the, a, a new sacrifice under this covenant, when I see Jesus Christ, my living cornerstone, here's my life. And there's a glory that's gonna break out when everyone will so, be so enamored with this Christ and dwelling with him in oneness. And, and when this starts to break out, spiritual sacrifices are going to go all over the place. And his glory is going to be seen, and it's going to move, and it's, it's power. This is so glorious compared to that old temple. What I'm seeing here this morning is so much better. I've been thinking a lot about this. There's a glory every time we assemble. And yet, I, I, just in studying history, his glory breaks out more intensely at different times throughout history. And you see, there have been so many times when the church, uh, it just becomes a structure. It just becomes a, a place that becomes cold and dead and external. You just come, and I do church. Church is a building, and you don't understand at all what I'm talking about, and that's when there's just no glory. Ichabod. It, it just, all we're doing is going through motions and doing things, and it's not spiritual. It's just external. You know how many churches are dead? And, and, and every once in a while, the glory of God breaks out, and you get things like a reformation from Martin Luther. The glory had departed from that era. And Martin Luther, the glory breaks out in his heart, and the gospel of grace takes it over. And Jesus Christ is that cornerstone, and he becomes a living stone in Christ. And it broke out upon the whole world. And it still is today. His glory, when we get the cornerstone and we keep coming to him, the oneness then that we have because we trust this cornerstone together and he's everything, his glory breaks out. It does amazing things. It doesn't break out when you're all about materialism. It doesn't break out if you're cold-hearted. When you lose your first love and everything becomes external. And we become a club. I belong to Southside Bible Club. We become an institution. And that'll never get it done, guys. That's not spiritual sacrifices. And at times, a church gets it. 
and the glory of God breaks out like I saw Friday night. God's grace becomes amazing grace and people are just taken up with the glories and the beauties of this cornerstone. And when that happens, spiritual sacrifices and his glory just breaks out everywhere. So at times, a church gets it and it happens. I heard an example this week I wanted to share with you from one of my favorite preachers. He said, in 1857, downtown in New York City, there was a layman whose name was Jeremiah. I like that name. At noontime, he decided, I want to start a prayer meeting. He worked on Wall Street. And I'm just going to just start a prayer meeting and see what God will do. And the first day, nobody came. And the second day, I think one person came, and he just kept praying. And it just kept growing, and it actually caught fire to where 10,000 people gathered on Wall Street and this place to pour out their hearts in prayer before God. And it went to the churches, and it caught fire. And in 1857 to 1860, 50,000 to 80,000 people were converted. That was 10% of the population then in New York City. What happened? The glory filled the temple. (laughs) And they began to see the glory of this God from living stones who are beholding the stone. So I just want you to think about this. We are the glory of God when the cornerstone fills our hearts. And he is the focus of all areas and every ministry that we do. Christ is the center. We are the manifestation then of the glory of God, and it can break out at any time. It can break out in your families. It can break out in your neighborhoods, in this church, in this city, and in this world. There is no limit to the glory of God that a church can shine forth when it gets the beauty of what I'm talking about this morning. I I would rather die than have this be an institution. I want it to be the glory of God by us being living stones, coming to him again and again and again till I reflect him, offering up spiritual sacrifices. So that's for free. That's your pastor dreaming, okay? We'll get back to the text, but do you see what I'm getting at? I I have a vision of what this could become. Now, we are a royal priesthood, and he says to proclaim his excellencies. We are now priests, so we no longer have higher, more spiritual people going to God for us. Almost every religion, there's always a priest. They're the super spiritual people who are gonna represent us before God. So we go to them because we can't go straight to God and they'll help us. They'll kind of mediate for us. But now we have what's called the priesthood of the believers. There's no one more special or higher up to make mediation for us. Don't come to me saying, pastor, if you pray, God will listen. No, there's no, he'll listen to every one of us. We're believers. There's no one higher up. We're all a priesthood and we all go into the presence of God through Jesus Christ and offer up sacrifices. So there's no hierarchy of people that have more acceptance with God and can get us closer. We now are priests in this temple, all of us, every believer, and you're to go and make sacrifices to this God and they're not bulls and goats and lambs. Those ended with their fulfillment The Lamb of God was sacrificed for sinners once and for all, and now we make spiritual sacrifices. How are you doing with your spiritual sacrifices? You offering up spiritual sacrifices to God? Some of you might say, well, I'm not doing so good. I I get like a C minus or maybe a D on this. And look what he says. You you offer up spiritual sacrifices in verse 5, acceptable to God. How? Through Jesus Christ. Only what is done through him is acceptable to God. Hear this. Nothing else will ever be acceptable to God. You can bring a million things and apart from through Christ, it is unacceptable. There's this thing called Ramadan. They celebrate and you bow down to the north and and wherever they are all over the world, they go to the north and they, they worship. And all over the world, people offer up sacrifices to God to appease him. And the cults, all the cults, is every, every one of them, there's a God we know we're not right with, so there's something we need to do to offer up sacrifices so he will accept us. 
And most people believe there's a God and they want to feel acceptable to him. They want to get on his right side. And the strategies of mankind are amazing, doing deeds, fasting, traveling, doing sacrifices, self-harm. Just the list goes on and on of here's the sacrifices I'm going to offer up to God to be acceptable. And I can tell you clearly and plainly they don't work. Give it up. (laughs) They will not get you to God. Nothing will bring you to God that you do will ever be acceptable. He's a holy God who you can never come into his presence. You can't even come and offer a sacrifice. You can't come near to God because he's holy. And there is a way through the cornerstone that can make you acceptable through Jesus Christ to come loved and accepted right into his presence and say, here's my offering. And if I come by faith in Christ and loving him and through him, every sacrifice I give is now acceptable to God. Romans 15, 18, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, says Paul, (coughs) resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. I will boast in nothing except what Christ does through me. Everything I do is through Christ. That's my acceptable sacrifice. Those are the spiritual sacrifices that Peter's trying to drive us to. So get this, without Christ... Nothing is acceptable to God. Nothing. Just sinners under the wrath of God. And there is nothing you can do. There's, you can't come to this church, clean yourself up and read your Bibles and ever make yourself acceptable to God. There is nothing you can do except look to the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, who lived the life you should have and died the death that you deserved. And now you can come into the presence of God and offer up spiritual sacrifices. So what are they? They are Romans 12.1. They are offering up your bodies to God now. They are whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. A holy priesthood is everything that we do now all week long. It's not a Sunday service. This is who you are day in and day out. As we offer up praise and service to our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the writer of Hebrews 13. Through him then, Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that just give thanks to his name. That's what you should do. This Thursday, I pray that'll flow out of this church. I pray it'll flow every day. That's the sacrifice. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So a spiritual sacrifice is anything I do now with my mind and body, uh, tongue, whatever it is, that are spiritual. And so I've been asking myself all week, what then is spiritual Bible reading? What is spiritual sharing of my faith? What is spiritual singing? What is spiritual preaching? Am I preaching spiritually right now? Did David lead spiritually this morning? Was it spiritual singing? And spiritual is when it's all done in light of the cornerstone. Everything that I say and do, it's not externals. It's not trying to earn favor with God. It's because of this finished work in Jesus Christ. Everything I do flows out of that, and therefore it is now spiritual worship to God. It's all done in light of in him, through him, and to him. I I preach in reliance upon him and power from him, shaped by his word for his glory. Everything you do is is the cornerstone. That's the only way you're going to get spiritual worship. And so my prayer is that everything that is done here at Southside would be spiritual sacrifices. I pray that if you are a greeter, you greet with spirituality. It's a spiritual greeting. I love you because Christ has first loved me. It isn't I just smile, it's I love you. Welcome, brother. Welcome, sister, into our temple of God. It's listening and the power of his spirit. Are you listening spiritually now? Is there a rising desire for his glory as you hear the word of God? Or is it, get this over so I can go to lunch? Goodness, pastor, that's not spiritual listening. Come and Hear the word of God and you're dwelling with Christ and you're listening and you're seeing what the glory of the temple could be, my own life. I want spiritual sacrifices. That's spiritual listening. 
Do you have a spiritual love for the body of Christ? It's rising up from Jesus Christ, and I don't, oh, I gotta do one thing so I feel good that I helped the church. This is who I am. This is a spiritual love because it's coming from the cornerstone. It's coming from what he has done for me, and so I have a spiritual love for this body. I have a spiritual service to anyone in need. It just comes from the cornerstone. It comes not to get accepted, but because I am accepted. It comes because we're brothers and sisters. It comes because I am one with Jesus Christ. And, and now this is a spiritual act of worship. I wonder if, that, if, if God took away everything we did this week that wasn't spiritual, what would be left on the table? Could it be? It becomes spiritual through Jesus Christ. I long for the word of God because I've tasted of his kindness. And I long for him because of his kindness. I keep coming to him. And I keep coming to him that I might offer up spiritual sacrifices from my life in Christ. That that is what will happen here on Sundays and, and throughout the week. Oh, and his glory could break out. And it could be put on display in the temple of God. And the world will come in here and say, surely God is in this place. What is this? I've never seen anything like this. And I just, I tell you, his glory can break out if we'll be the temple of God that comes to him and offers up spiritual sacrifices. Quits using one another, but actually in fullness of Christ comes and loves in a spiritual way. And we offer up sacrifices. I was thinking in closing, just some of the sacrifices here in Peter's epistle, just in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, put off malice. So my my spiritual sacrifice now is because of the cornerstone, instead of wickedness, I'm going to show kindness to people. Instead of guile, which meant to trap people, instead of setting people up and always trying to trap them, I, I'm now spiritual sacrifices, I'm seeking people's best. Instead of hypocrisy, where you do all the right things when everybody's looking and you want to look spiritual, he's saying now to, to give a sacrifice of being real, being real people who really are acting out what Jesus Christ is changing and bringing out of your life. Put off hypocrisy and give the sacrifice of realness. Put off envy, where every time someone outdoes you, looks better, doesn't invite you to their party, you're green. He says, put that off and be someone who rejoices with those who rejoice and love to see blessing in other people's lives. That's my spiritual act of worship. Put off slander, where you gossip about other people and you say it's just a prayer request and you're slandering and you're devising and hurting the body of Christ. Put that off. And now, because of the cornerstone, come speak words that build up and and help people become more like Jesus Christ. Put on a stretching love of 1 Peter 1, 22, of an agape. That's a spiritual sacrifice when I become real from this cornerstone and I just now give out the glory of God because it's real and it's from him and everyone who who looks at it is going to see the glory of God. Guys, they used to come and look at the temple and say, man, this, this is way more. Solomon is more than we ever heard of or thought. I want people to come look at this temple and say, this is more beautiful than anything I've ever heard of or seen. Living stones built on the cornerstone, offering up spiritual sacrifices. Oh, that the world would see what God has designed this to be and say, there is nothing like this. I want to be a part. I want in the temple. Well, I'll come to the cornerstone. I offer you the cornerstone this morning, if all your life is a sham, there's something that can change it. And it's not your effort and your good works. There's a cornerstone who was bloodied for you. And there's a cornerstone who holds out his hands and says, come to me. If you're weary and heavy laden because you're trying to do all these things and you have no heart, come to me and I'll give you rest for your souls. So I pray if that's you this morning, I'll be up here afterwards and I would love Uh, to talk with you and help that burden fall off of trying to live the Christian life without a cornerstone. (laughs) Oh, he's lovely. Come let him bring spiritual sacrifices from knowing and loving 
Jesus Christ. I pray that the glory of God would break out in this place. I think we could shine so much more than we do. And may all that we do as a church, may it be spiritual. Let's join together and offer up spiritual sacrifices. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this glorious picture that Peter is painting for us. I love this new temple. God, I love the cornerstone. I love how beautiful it is. It's a choice stone, a precious stone to you. And oh God, by us becoming alive, he's a precious choice stone to us. Though we do not see him, we love him. God, I thank you for this sweet Christ. And I pray that we would be a people who keep coming to him again and again and again. And from that place, God, that we would offer up spiritual sacrifices, real ones, the ones that are that pleasing aroma to you. God, don't let us be dead and external and just a a building. God, let the the temple of God uh, put out your glory by these stones that you have chosen and placed, fitted together, just perfect in this temple. I pray that this local body uh, would, would put that glory on display and that you would be pleased to blow through this city and through this world, through our families and through our neighborhoods and our schools. God, that people would see this glory and that this glory would be bigger than ourselves, our own acceptance, how people treat us. God, let your glory be bigger and let us show the world a unity among diversity on our cornerstone. And it's on Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.